Okay, so hi, Silvana. Um, so we normally, um, Eddie, Simon, do a, a bit of a kind of quick check-in where you get to kind of get a sense of who are the people in the room. No doubt about it, the series has absolutely been, um, I, I don't know, a, a better, deeper experience by everybody's contribution. So um, we're definitely learning that having an hour of somebody talking to us, although that's great, um, people being able to contribute is um, really helpful. So, um, yeah, please uh, let us know if you've got something to say. Um, the check-in is a way for you to hear who's here. And what we have been doing is just kind of connecting to the theme of the session. So today, the theme is money. And I just wondered if a good check-in would be, we just go around, tell you our names and our kind of connection to the series or why we're here. And what's a headline for you when you try to connect to the theme of money in relation to the keys to citizenship? Um, now you might not have one, that's fine, but uh, I'll call on people so that it keeps us um, going but i'm gonna start with steve because steve you were here first i think <laughs> okay good morning i'm steve easter and uh, i'm in the uk i'm a retired manager of uh, services for people who have um, learning disabilities um but uh, these days i'm uh, doing a phd on uh, citizenship for young people who have idd and uh, I guess money always crops up as something important. It's probably not about the money itself, but the quality of life, um, the, the, the extent that people really do gain citizenship. Um, so it's not about whether it's big money, small money, but what does it actually do? Fabulous, thanks, Steve. Bev? Hi, um, so I'm Bev from Aviva and uh, I support WASE as well. Um, the word money to me means security actually. Um, and yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. So I'm looking forward to this session. Thanks Bev. Anik? Hi, so I'm Anik Jensen. I'm working together with Silvana on a project called the Now and Next uh, Project. Um, supporting families of very young children. Um, so for me, uh, if in, in the context of supporting families, um, I just have a crossroad in front of me. So if a family does have NDIS money or access to other funding, I say, well, great, let's see how we uh, use the budget in the best possible way, most efficiently. And if the family doesn't have money, I say, well, great, there's so many opportunities out there in the community. So I always try to um, look at the outcomes that we want to uh, achieve and, and connect the money back to that if there is money. Thank you, Anik. Rachel? Hi guys, I'm Rachel. I work at Inclusion WA. So my role, I'm really lucky I get to do a mix of direct support as well as uh, service and support coordination and supporting other staff. So I get to do um, a bit of everything, which is nice. Um, for me, today's, I guess, the session topic, money, um, in working directly with clients, this is something that comes up a lot, whether learning to budget, having more um, financial independence. Um, for me, it comes, is tied very much into rights um, to access, um, as well as also having choice and control, because too often money becomes the excuse which is really, um, you know, taking away equal opportunities to access services um, and resources and things in the community or for people to have their own choice and freedom in deciding and controlling how they use money and the financial resources available to them. So to me, it's tied very much with those two topics. Fabulous. Thanks, Rachel. Alex? Hi guys, um, I'm Alex Jefferson, I'm in Western Australia, um, I'm currently contract, a contractor uh, working with people who self-manage um, and money money is a massive sort of thing for us, it's um, for a lot of people who are sort of at risk and given a lot of support, 
course, but still struggling for money. So yeah, if you hear you guys' opinions on money. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. That was a little bit disjointed, Alex, just so that you, you're aware that, I don't know if the internet connection might be dropping out, but just so that you know, it was a, it was a little bit difficult to hear. Okay, I'll get my headphones, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, Wendy? So, Wendy, you're muted. Hi, Wendy Palmer Thanks. from um, Perth, uh, working a service that supports adults with disabilities. Um, I'm sorry, I missed all the introductions. I have um, some stuff going on around me today, but um, I'm looking forward to today's session. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. Silvana? Hi, um, uh, I'm talking to you today as Silvana, um, mother of Karim Bushafa. <laughs> Sorry, we just had our NDIS plan and it was very traumatizing. Oh, was I'm it? Just gonna, yeah, I'm just going to gather my thoughts because I want to say something important. Okay. I will be okay. I told our planner, our local area coordinator today that funding does not equal a good life for my son. When he asked us to save money because we wouldn't get the package that we received or enough money to do the things that we were doing in the past year, and he told us and recommended to us congregated services. And this is after self-managing since 2009. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry for the tears, guys, but I feel a bit emotional. I did want to join in and listen today because of the topic and also to share what I feel strongly about is that whilst funding doesn't give you a good life, the way systems treat us citizens, as you'd say, Simon, this system is not working. And I've experienced it today myself. Sorry, I won't take the floor anymore. I'm going to listen and maybe contribute a little bit later when I'm a bit more composed. Okay, thank you, Silvana. Stephanie? Are you there, Stephanie? No, I think you must still be on mute. No, it may be your headphones. That may be one of the options. Yeah. Um, I'm you we can just hear you, just a very quiet. So if you could be a bit louder. Okay, so um, with me around, oh, so Stephanie from Perth, uh, working for NDS at the minute. Um, I, I'm sorry to hear your news um, the last speaker. Um, the thing with me about money is about a support to get uh, uh, supportive services, but it's also around uh, ability to contribute as a citizen um, in their own right through being um, a valued employee or a, um, you know, a owner of a business of some sort. So for me, there's two aspects to the money. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. I'll go next before handing over to you, Simon and Eddie. Um, I, I think I, I, I kind of feel like I'm reflecting everybody's thoughts, really, from Steve in terms of money's not the total answer, um, but then also here in Silvana's experience, and I'm in contact with lots of people and families who that is their experience. You know, it, there isn't enough funding, and yeah, the kind of flexibility to do what you can with the funding is also limited. So I'm really interested, challenged, I don't know, by the whole topic of money. So really uh, looking forward to today's conversation. Simon, if I hand over to you. Okay. So I think uh, Eddie and I, our preparation was um, simply that, I think I'm gonna talk for a little bit, uh, but not too long maybe about 20 minutes and dig into the concept of money. Um, it's funny, I think that the, 
the whole talk is the whole series was talked about citizenship in action but i think if anything what we've tended to do is drift into almost philosophy so each session has actually dug deeper into the meaning of the thing and so i'm just going to go with that and try and talk about why money is important to citizenship um uh, in a, and hopefully that helps enrich our actions or think about um i think in you know what what Silvana's touching on is the social justice aspects that are at stake here. Um, the, the movement to citizenship is for me not some kind of uh, personal, I don't know, personal development booklet. It's about social change. Um, and money is one of the critical elements in challenging systemic injustice. So, I, as ever, I'm going to show some slides, but just checking in with Eddie. Is that okay, Eddie? So I'll talk for about 20 minutes, and then, and then you, you've got some thoughts that you want to share from your, your experience, and you'll build on that, but we'll allow people to talk in between our two sessions. Does that make? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to share these slides, I think, if I can remember how to do this. Um, share... Um, there we go, share, okay, so can everybody see that, there's a one big image, yeah, okay, um, so, uh, so in the last talk, John O'Brien, I think, very correctly said, you know, we're not, the idea of freedom it's not best thought about as freedom just from oppression or freedom from control, but it's got to be freedom for something, freedom to do something. In fact, John even defined freedom, I think, in, as, as having control of uh, the necessary resources for citizenship um, so that you can fulfill the responsibilities of citizenship. So really, the idea of introducing money to citizenship is really just the second part of that equation. Uh, it's about controlling, but controlling what? Well, I'm going to not suggest that money is, is, is everything, but it's certainly an important thing. And it's in, interestingly something that people uh, sometimes struggle. It either becomes a little bit like um, Anik was talking about, it either becomes everything or nothing when actually the key to a good life is that it's enough and that money is part of um, what we focus on. So, I mean, in this, this point here is, is one I think is worth stressing, even if it seems a little bit subtle. Money is not a straightforwardly good thing. In other words, more and more of it doesn't make life better. Um, money is a bit more like oxygen. Yeah, so, I mean, if you don't have it, you die. And, and actually that in, our, in the modern world, really, that is true unless you're in living in very specific kind of cultures and communities where, which do without it, um, but they distribute resources differently. But actually too much money is also like oxygen, is an explosive environment. It's not actually good for people uh, or good for communities. And if you think about what money does, what money does is it kind of enables you to get somebody's assistance. You know, it might be, you know, you might, you might have spent the money on a potato, but really what you're doing is distributing resources back to the potato farmer and all the other people who've, who've brought that potato to you. So you're really sharing resources with each other. And money is about the interdependence we have. It's saying, well, I need potatoes, but uh, I, want, I never think what I'm doing, but whatever it is that I do that sometimes means that people give me money <laughs> means that I can give the potato farmer money, what have you. So, and what's important in this is that um, it implies, and I think this is what's important to citizenship, it implies that we can live together with our own goals um, and our own projects, our own sense of what's important, and we don't have to align those things perfectly. 
And so again, it seems a bit funny to put it like this, but I, it says here, you don't need money in a totalitarian society. If somebody's controlling everything, then you don't need money. They can just say, you do that, you do that, you do that. You can distribute the resources by some totalitarian system. And in a funny way, you don't need money within the economy of a family. Now, a family is a much more benign thing than a totalitarian society. But if you think about why you don't need money in a family, it's because um, it would actually break the relationships of kind of mutual love, respect, trust in the family if you started paying each other for the services that you're providing to each other. You, families are interdependent units, but they're interdependent units where money isn't an appropriate form of exchange. So I, I think about money as something that is um, like oxygen. It lets a community breathe. It lets citizens get on with things to be mutually interdependent and to support each other. But it isn't everything. Um, the, the, I've, I've shared a couple of quotes, not because they fit perfectly into my talk, but I just, I just like them and they touch on some of the things you talked about. Um, this is from a fantastic Icelandic novelist, Haldor Laxness, and, and it's the voice of a character in the book, The Atom Station. Uh, and she says, I neither want to make a poor man dress me in rags, nor a rich man dress me in furs for having slept with him. I want to buy myself a coat for money, which I have earned for myself, because I am a person. So citizenship is also closely connected to our ideas of uh, self-respect, of our status as citizens. Um, the... The, the ancient Athenians, who, who in many ways defined what citizenship, democracy, and, and uh, means, were very focused on ensuring that citizens were not so reliant on other people that they were in their debt. So you couldn't, um, one of the big democratic reforms in Athens was basically banning the ability for people to make themselves in debt to other people. So the only people who could lend money in Athens were slaves. Uh, only slaves could be bankers, curiously. And that's because they didn't like the idea that some people would owe people so much money that they would lack freedom and self-respect. Um, and this is quite a challenging quote from Karl Koenig, who was one of the founders of the Camp Hill movement, but it, it represents a kind of also important theme Again, one that uh, Anik touches on. Wages create a barrier between the one who receives and the one who pays. To give and to take is a matter of mutual human relationships. The true relationship goes as soon as wages intervene. Paid service is no service. Paid love is no love. Paid help has nothing to do with help. And, and this, for me, I'm not quite sure whether I agree with this quote even, but I think that it represents an important debate in our community about when when is money helpful and when does it stop being helpful when does money invade relationships in the way that i talked about with family such that it actually gets in the way of relationships because we certainly you know again we don't pay our friends to be our friends so thinking about the keys to citizenship and say, and John touched on this in the last session, if we think about the search for meaning as, the, as a beginning point, I mean, in a way you can start actually with the keys at any point, but it, it, it's cleanest to start in the middle uh, and then to move to the question of, so what do I want? What's a life of meaning for me? Am I free to do it? And then money arises out of trying to answer the question, what do I need to make that happen? Now, for me, one of the really critical moments was um, having invented in England the system of personal budgets and self-directed support that uh, the government then used to kind of develop our own version of NDIS, which also had major problems. Um, my friend Pippa Murray said to me, you know, this personal budget idea is a really good one, Simon, but really for families, uh, m money is not the main form of wealth. 
families have their own real wealth and that that wealth is about the relationships people have, the community that they can access, their gifts, the resources that they have control over, and most importantly, their ability to integrate and share those ideas. And so, um, and strangely, John O'Brien also pointed me to the work of these economists, Hegel and Celie Brown, which talked about the difference between push economics and pull economics. And I thought this was really helpful because it seemed to me when we are talking about NDIS and we're talking about some of the system change stuff that we're struggling with in Australia in Britain and in other countries, I think the struggle is because we can't quite break away from what they talked about as push economics. Push economics is when the system says, we know what's best for you, whether that be uh, so many hours of care, uh, living in a group home, you know, living in an institution, we know what's best for you and we'll buy it for you. We'll push those resources into this thing and then you can get it. Um, you can get the service that we've purchased. And what by putting together what John was pointing me to and what um, Pippa was working on with families, it seemed to me that we would be better to think about the work we're engaged in as more like pull economics. So what we want to do in a way is, is combine the two things that Anik touched on, which is on the one hand, we, we want people to be able to access for reasons of justice, sufficient resources to make it easier for them to be a citizen. But the spirit in which we want to do that is one which where we say, well, it's people themselves by combining their connection to community, their use of their own gifts, their relationships with others, and the other resources they have. It's their ability to bring those things together creatively that makes the, the budget element, the NDIS element, uh, helpful. So that's the way I picture the work we're involved in now. It is not about citizens going out and purchasing services, which is in a sense a little bit more like the push economics model. It's more about people using resources in the context of their wider life to build greater citizenship. And the paradox is, and we have this in the UK as you have it in Australia, even when the system shifts towards so-called individualized funding, the spirit of the system still operates from this push economics perspective. So what it says is, oh, well, we'll give people and families control, but you can only buy what we would have bought before, which is really to collapse the whole thing. So what is money? What does it do? Well, another way of looking at this, and again, this seems a little bit simplistic, but in one sense, how do you get anybody to do anything for you? And it seems to me that really you can break down the reasons people do things for you into some form of either love or money. Yeah, we people do things for us. Maybe it's not love, it's certainly not always romantic love, but if it's out of a sense of duty or responsibility, um, family, friendship, community action, in a way, those are all aspects of love. That People do things because their, their will makes them feel like that's the thing that I should do. Or somebody pays them. And, they, and when you pay somebody, in a way, you're paying somebody to do something probably they might not have done <laughs> unless you'd paid them. And I think that's why um, so many people still feel that in a funny way, well, let's, we could, maybe with the ideal world, we'd get rid of money altogether. Um, I just think that we should be looking to create a community which has a bit of both, that where we have um, love and money, that we shouldn't be forced to choose them between them, and systems shouldn't force us to choose between them. Uh, we should be able to take uh, both parts of what Anik has touched on and deploy them intelligently. But it is worth thinking about why we, um, why money and discussing money makes us feel so uncomfortable. When, when inventing the kind of personal budget system in England, I would often um, be criticized for this focus on money and 
And often people would say, well, Simon's all about trying to uh, commodify the system, turn people into products that they can be purchased. Um, this doesn't, there isn't enough attention to relationships and community. Um, I didn't think that was true, but I think it's interesting where people's um, fears are coming from. Uh, you know, the, this fear that if we talk about money, sometimes that we're going to get ourselves into a tricky situation that maybe it's a little bit undignified to talk about money. Um, but there is this Latin phrase, cui bono, which means who benefits from our unwillingness to think about money? And, and it seems to me that, well, it isn't the poor who benefit <laughs> from this, oh, well, money's something, oh, we wouldn't want to talk about that at the dining table, like kind of, kind of middle class. We wouldn't want to talk about salary differences or income levels or, um, uh, you know, oh, Simon, you're getting a bit too political, somebody said to me the other day when I was talking about poverty in Britain. <laughs> you know, so it's like that. It's a bit uncomfortable uh, to start talking about these things. I, I was working with a um, uh, women's centre in Halifax uh, a few years ago, and, and there we were looking at the situation of women, most of whom didn't have any obvious disability in the, in, the, um, in the sense that we might mean coming from working with people with intellectual disabilities, but certainly had many, many disadvantages. And what you discovered is that economic poverty was really just also a part of a deeper poverty. And that, that poverty was at its heart. This is like the, the opposite to the real wealth model. You saw women who were excluded, who were isolated, who were powerless and disadvantaged. And what that would feed into too often was a loss of hope. And, you know, so I think, I think talking about poverty is also one of the things that if we're talking about citizenship, we need to talk about how, why we should be rejecting poverty Poverty in all its forms, but poverty is what is the evil that is at war with our capacity to be citizens. So for me, that's why it is worth, uh, and these may be policy questions that don't interest us so much, but I think it's interesting. We've already touched on the idea of self-directed support or NDIS. Well, what is that? Well, fundamentally at its best, it's saying, well, how do we convert this service system, which um, is where money has been locked into certain responses to need under the definition and control of professionals, and how do we liberate those resources to put them under the control of people with disabilities and families? But I think it's interesting to think about uh, ideas like basic income as well. So I, I, in, I'm involved in this, this movement internationally, which is saying, actually, we need to eliminate poverty by ensuring every single individual has the basic resources they need to live a life of citizenship. And then there was the other point that was made in the, in the discussions, though, is we shouldn't forget the importance of people earning money and having opportunities to earn money, because that's one of the ways in which people have an income um, and it gives people self-respect. And so how do we build systems of open employment that make it easier for people to earn money from each other? The challenge here is enormous on all these areas. So this is just a statistic on um, this comes from Lancashire from a few years ago where I was working with their service, service system. But you can see that the, the, the huge problem in service system is that we've just decided to spend billions of pounds, billions of Australian dollars on stuff that we then give to people. Um, and that isn't neutral. Once that money's invested, it's like a magnet that, that draws people into its... Um, control. When people control money, and this is from a research report um, we did, a couple of reports we did when I was in control, um, what's interesting is what people do is spend the money on citizenship in a way. What they do is they use the money to, to join in the community, to get a job, to go to things that exist in the community, to get assistance that goes with them. So given a decent shot, people 
flip that system around and say, no, I want the resources to follow me and my journey of citizenship. I think, I mean, this, this is maybe a rather odd slide to include, but it also strikes me one of the things we don't like talking about is inequality. I don't know what the level of inequality, wage inequality in the Australian service system is, but the wage inequality in the UK service system is extraordinary. Um, and if you go even further and look at the difference between people's base income, so people with disabilities income and the, the income of the richest people paid by the public sector, then you get these enormous inequalities. Um, are, you know, so I put in here one to 50. If you take the, what people on the lowest income receive and then what people like the chief executive of the NHS receive, the difference is a ratio of one to 50. This is incredibly inefficient as well. <laughs> so if you distribute resources in this highly unequal way, you get much less useful work done. So I think it's also just one of the things we need to start talking about. If we're going to tackle poverty and if we're going to take care of each other and the community, then actually much more egalitarian systems will get much more good stuff done. And this is about basic income. So I'm involved in an effort with my friend Jim Elder Woodward, who's one of the leaders from the independent living movement in Scotland, in trying to define the idea of basic income plus. So the idea of basic income is that everybody gets a basic income, but we also, on top of that, the plus element is for those people who need additional resources because of their, their disability. Um, and we've tried to argue that there are um, good reasons to do it this way, that it's better for people with disabilities if they are part of a universal system that gives everybody the basic income and that the, the additional elements are treated as additional elements. They're not a separate system. Um, but the other interesting thing about us, this discussion, and it's, it touches a little bit on um, you know, so what Silvano is experiencing, what, we're, what we've discovered is that as the system supposedly tries to transfer control to people with disabilities, it can't quite do it. It keeps trying to pull back that control. So I'm quite curious about the idea of actually saying, well, wouldn't it be interesting if instead of complex bureaucratic systems like NDIS or the social care system in uh, Britain or Medicaid in the United States, all these complicated systems by which we say, oh yes, you know, we're now really going cutting edge services that will give people control just kind of, if you fill in the right form in the right way and you please this bureaucrat and you please that bureaucrat, what would it be like instead if we just said, no, this really is your money? It is really your money. It's no different to all the other income you receive. Um, I think that we need to start at least considering whether that might be a better way forward because we're certainly finding that the system has taken back a lot of control of individualized funding systems. So those are some of the policy questions at a practice level. Of course, these are some of the things you might be wanting to explore with people you're working with. So, you know, what can you do to earn money? What can you do to get what you're entitled to? You know, that for in the UK would be about the benefit system or the pension system, sometimes it's called. Savings, I think, is something we don't talk about enough because savings, is, as Bev talks about, actually also give us security. They allow us to take risks. I think that's why we should also be um, worried about benefit systems that penalize people for having savings because savings are often very, very useful of, on the citizenship journey. Of course, we've got to think about how people can have control over resources and uh, in practice, that's about how the banking system works, how people can access the banking system, what kind of support people need around their finances and how that's managed. And then critically, uh, how people can use the resources they have. Um, you know, I mean, one of the really cool things we see some people do with their personal budgets is they actually go and 
they don't just get a job, they go and create a business. So they use their budget in a sense to go back around this circle and start creating a whole new little businesses uh, that can engage with people in the community. So uh, these are some of the questions I thought we might want to talk about, but uh, <laughs> we'll see where we go. Um, you know, so how do we, how do we get, manage this tension between, on the one hand, I think we've got, to, we've got to accept that poverty is a real threat to citizenship, and we've got to be prepared to talk about that. At the same time as we have to recognize that you can't buy a life of meaning, you can't buy citizenship. Um, it isn't a product to be purchased in a supermarket. How do we, how do we balance those two considerations? Um, what is the responsibility of professionals who are often far from poor, at least, you know, the, the more senior ones, when they're, they're working with people who are poor? Um, I think there are, you know, one of the key members of uh, Citizen Network is Varun Vidyarati, who works in India with people in extreme poverty. And what Varun talks about is the, the humility that's required to really work alongside people and empower them, as opposed to coming in as the expert who will take care of their problems for them. Because, um, you know, all, all battles for civil rights, all battles against social injustice have to be won from the grassroots. And middle-class professionals coming in and trying to sort out people's lives for them is not going to lead to that kind of social change. And the last question, I, I don't know, I think is, could we not be bolder about talking about poverty? Uh, in our work, uh, can we can we not treat poverty as if it's somebody else's problem to deal with, and we're just talking about services and systems? So that seems like quite a lot. I need to come somehow get out of this. Uh, stop share. There we go. Okay. So. Um, Shall I hand back to Kate for a little bit of the Kate well, thing? I wonder, um, has anybody got any stuff that is bubbling up for them? So um, I know that's a really big question. So Bev gave me a bit of advice after the last session saying just inviting questions can be a bit intimidating for people. But is anything kind of bubbling up for people that you think I want to just comment on that or I've got a thought about some of the stuff that Simon was saying? Nick? Sorry, my mute button, my mute button disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just thinking actually, uh, it, it does relate to what Silvana said, but um, I, uh, it is always in the back of my mind that the, what can we learn from the example of what happened to the UK? For any uh, for all the other you know countries going through this um, trans uh, transformations because at the at, we front load a hell of a lot of um, planning and care and you know how should it be done and control and all that and then and then we have seen it time and again that in the background governments just after all is done slashes some of the, you know, some of the direct funding that's given to families. And, uh, and, and again, against that, it's like, once again, individuals fighting the system. I, I don't know if that's the right question to ask now, but it's just on my mind now because I've been very affected by what Sylvana said and, and, and it's been in the back of my mind also, you know, like the, the dichotomy between all this, you know, and the, 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 the philosophical ideas and the justice and all of that, that that Simon talked about is so important. And then, you know, it's like there's a front uh, shop window. It's at the front and it's, you know, it's good. It's 
we need to take care of, we need to take this. But then in the background, there's stuff that happens and then the individuals are back against the system. So I don't know if it's the right time to say it, but I'm just going to put it in. It's not a question, sorry. That's Apologies. Okay. But if That's Simon, okay. if you have something to say, Simon, about that as a, you know, it happened to the UK and you lucky, you know, we're lucky to have you that you, dis, that you um, are constantly on the alert and you're, um, Ray, you know, ringing, you know, raising the attention, people's attention to that. So, can you say something to that about what other people can learn from that? Well, I think that um, there, you learn that there are no easy victories, and exactly as you say, that what you can be given on one hand can be taken away on the other hand, and that, um, and and I think that. People like me, I think, were were a little bit uh, naive about um, the battles for personalization or what have you, because you 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 tend to you can invent technology. I, I mean, it's a funny word. I don't mean computers, but you can invent approaches which can help shift the power uh, towards people with disabilities. But underneath that things can start shifting in the other direction and they're not immediately in your control. I mean, the most extreme thing in the UK is just, if you just take our disability support system, in 2009, it supported 1.8 million people and today it supports 1 million people. So 0.8 million people, that's a lot of people with disabilities, just don't get a service anymore. So we're not solving the problem of waiting lists, we're just getting rid of those people as people who are eligible for services. And that's not even something the system likes to talk about. So I think one of the things, again, I mean, it's a hard thing to say, but I think if we're having a genuine conversation about citizenship, then we can't avoid these questions of personal responsibility, community action, and how we organize to stand up for our rights and i think the division between which is clearly for you for you and silvana you're not you're you you combine being mothers and professionals and, and some of us share those kind of combinations and other people it's divided but in a way the two different approaches which is on the one right well yes okay we we understand that you uh, you might have a problem, you might be an advocate, you might be a campaigner, but you kind of belong over here. And then the professionals occupy this land of, um, oh, well, our job is to manage limited resources. If the government gives us less money, then our job is to manage less money. If, if these systems say we must uh, do this, this and this, even if it's a bit crazy, well, we, we better just carry on working at how to do this, this and this, because that's our job. I'm not sure that's an attractive vision for 21st century citizenship, dividing ourselves in this way and unable to really get to the bottom of what we're fighting for. Um, I don't really know what the answer is, Anique, but I think greater integrity and honesty uh, is essential. I, I think that what we the game as it's been played in the second half of the 20th century at the beginning of the 21st century where we we break people into these boxes and some people are professionals some people are service users some people are politicians all of that well looking at it from a from an english perspective that looks like a very broken system indeed eddie do you want to Come in here. Have you, so your mute button is down in the left, that's it. Yeah, Got I'm, it. I'm a, bit, a bit rusty on this technology. So. <laughs> hey, thanks very much. Um, and hi, everybody. And good to see so many familiar faces. I think I know probably half the people on the screen. So that's, that's excellent. And, um, and Silvana, I'm, I'm just so sorry to hear about your experience today. And and I think it sort of it does relate a bit to part of my theme today about you know how people have got vision and they design things and then you know part of that is about shifting the power in the system 
but then just how quickly things snap back to the old way of doing things. And so, so this idea about how you um, take ideas forward with fidelity and integrity and make things stick. I think that's that's something I want to focus a bit on today. So I just want to, um, Savannah, um, wish I had an answer to your, to your situation today, but I just want to acknowledge um, uh, I found that very distressing as well. So, um, so for those who don't know me, I work as an independent consultant. Um, last five years, I do a mixture of work. Uh, I, do a, I still do a little bit of work for the NDIA uh, as an expert advisor. So I, I provide advice from time to time as an independent person on various aspects of the scheme. I also chair the uh, International Initiative for Disability Leadership, um, both in Australia, but also internationally. So I've got a role in development of that initiative, which is a leadership development and learning exchange initiative uh, between six member countries. We've got three other uh, participating countries. So I do a few other bits of consulting work, uh, do some work with not-for-profits and also some state governments and um, I'm on a few boards as well. So I've got a bit of a mix of different things. And prior to that, I did work in um, state government. I was a um, mental health commissioner at Western Australia. Uh, I was uh, director general of the Department for Communities and also as a director with the Disability Services Commission. So I've had a long time in government, um, state level, nationally, you know, probably last 20 years, I've been trying to find more and more spaces alongside people in the community, uh, trying to build ideas, as well as trying to make the system um, work better for people. So, um, so I thought I'd, um, Simon, I did have a bit of a chat about his presentation, and um, so I won't go over exactly the same ground. So I thought I'd probably just take a slightly um, um, now. I just want to share. Here we go. Um, here we go. Okay. So, everyone got that? That's, um, I just need to work out how I can, yeah, cool. Yeah, and look, so, so part of what I've done probably last 20 years, because I've worked in um, across about 12 different countries now as well doing independent consulting work, is I've really had a mission to try and find really good long term examples of people that have done a great job about effective person by person, family by family, local sort of community support and sort of ideas that have stuck, you know, over a long period of time, they've worked in different environments and they've got a good evidence base. So, so I've tried to really um, uh, sort of work with those ideas. So what I'm going to do today is I'm, I'm going to talk about this idea about where money and funding fits into practice frameworks. So taking these ideas of money and where they fit into um, a, a practice framework I use a couple of examples. One is local area coordination. The second is a, a, our community living plan. So it's really about where money fits and how you get it to do the right thing in the right relationship. I was then going to talk a bit about some examples where it's, it works for families to best do things themselves because it does give you a slightly different um, sort of, uh, as Simon said, what the government gives you they can take away. And so there's a couple of really neat Canadian examples about people doing things independent of government. Uh, due to that very reason that government can give and take. And so if you're planning for a safe and secure future, there might be some things that families want to control as opposed to handing over to the government. And then if we get time, but not necessarily, I just think the, the NDIS is an example of taking the broad issue of, you know, um, is it a welfare problem, a rationing problem, or is it a, it can be seen as an insurance uh, issue shared by the whole of the population uh, the NDIS in Australia, for people that um, aren't from Australia, is an example of a different way of thinking about the system as a whole. So um, I don't intend to go into that in any great detail, but if you have time, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. So just some fundamentals. Um, and these are things I've been sort of, um, particularly over the last 20 years, I've been trying to, to pull out of um, things that have got long-term evidence that are very authentic and work well. And I've sort of just brought them into a, a set of what I call fundamentals. And um, not surprisingly, the first one's about getting to know people well over time, person by person. I was often intrigued in government how people could have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of services, or even millions of dollars worth of services, and still have a very poor life. You know, and um, you know, many, many examples of the system rushes in, assesses people, comes up with plans, spends a lot of money, and get it wrong. And then the converse of that is really the more time you spend getting to know people, uh, uh, starting with that, then the better uh, the better job you do of supporting people. 
So it's almost like a paradox. You go slow to then make more progress, whereas the system can't help itself to get in quickly um, to solve a problem. Uh, the second one is about connection to the local community. And um, so this is really around if we sort of think that, well, you know, good life is about people having, you know, valued relationships and opportunities for contribution and, and being citizens in their local community, then the sort of staff we want to have working are people that are from community and understand how community works. So the idea about picking people that are well grounded in community, that are based in community rather than big, big government office buildings is a sort of a good fundamental place to start. Then we sort of go into the um, positive values and assumptions about people. Um, the, the old system as I knew it would sort of start with people's disability and control and sort of come up with solutions and then I'd often joke you'd give people people's lives back bit by bit as they demonstrate they could do things. Whereas we sort of try to flip that around to positive assumptions about what ordinary people can do and families and communities and then building safeguards as needed. So you start from a different, different presumption, but you're not naive about safeguards that people, um, people need. So in the middle, the language sounds the same, but it's a very, very different starting point. Um, the next one is about whether we see our job about building capacity and self-sufficiency versus providing services. And often the traditional system is um, you know, built around deficit, about providing services to fix problems. And sort of no matter how hard people try in that frame, people are often left feeling quite dependent. So we sort of see our job better to be building something that's self-sufficient as opposed to providing something. And then this thing about the right starting question, I think you all know the narrative that the old narrative was what services do people need? And sometimes that's what funding do people need? But it sort of it creates a language of respite and um, day programs and group homes and money and stuff as opposed to the good life question, which uh, people will start to talk about relationships and security, about having choices and control, about um, making a contribution and also having challenging things to do. So a different question gives you a whole different lot of things. Um, and then this thing about right relationships. And I've sort of found that um, the safest and best place is alongside people who are experts in their own lives, but you're bringing something as well. So it's being alongside people wherever they are, not being in front of people, leading the way, saying you've got the answers, or not being behind people, not keeping up with their aspirations and, and, and dreams. So it's being right alongside people where they are. And then the last bit is about um, flexible and pooled funding. So um, if you want to start to do things person by person that are more responsive, then you can't have your money tied up in fixed programs. Uh, and also, the unbundling uh, is also about giving people more choice and control and having flexibility, but it's not just disability programs, it's also welfare, uh, mental health, uh, justice, other, other buckets that when you put together, you can actually start, uh, start to craft solutions that do a much better job for people. So uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Alec Mansky from Canada, um, spoke about this really nice little frame sort of saying, um, we've all been brought up in a scarcity framework where you know, people's most fundamental needs are for money and service. There's not enough money, so therefore our job is to ration the money to get it to the people most in need. And so therefore people's whole identities become based on disability, dysfunction, critical needs, breakdown, and really the, the incentives are for the, the worse you are, the better your chances of getting money. So that's sort of like one narrative that sort of plays out. And um, here's sort of other narrative, which I, which I very much ascribe to is, you know, money can't, there's some things that are most important in people's lives that money can't buy, love and freely given relationships. And so if these are some of the most important things in people's lives, in fact, these are freely given um, uh, in the community. And so it's not a match, so there's an abundance of these opportunities. And so the challenge is about how we can unlock these opportunities, how we can best introduce people, how we can support people and move away from this sort of deficit, deficit sort of language. Um, and so the deficit language, like if you introduce people by the nature of their disability, of course, that's going to be a bit, very off-putting conversation. So, so the abundance framework, the key to that is about who people are, what they love to do, and sort of working from that. So I sort of found that these, um, so, uh, so the money is in the mix, but it's sort of a bit down the way. It's not the first thing we want to talk about. It's not the first question that we would ask. So um, I think we're going to go into a couple of practice frameworks. and. Um, 
So I've been working with locally aid coordinations um, since the late 1980s. And so it's a very, very simple idea um, that's now sort of grown quite a lot. But it's really, in it essence, it's about getting to know people and forming positive and trusting relationships, being based in and connected to communities, and then doing a series of strategies in the right order. So in many ways, it's a very, very simple sort of construct. But the evidence is that if you do it the right way, um, you get very, very um, uh, repeatable, positive sort of um, um, outcomes. So there's a bit of quick history. Started with a couple of, you know, a single project, uh, various expansions, um, you know, across Australia to other countries. Uh, it's now, um, we've got some very good examples in the UK, England and Wales, very high quality examples the last 10 years that my colleague um, Rolf Broad's been leading with support, Simon, of yourself and also the centre and also the um, the uh, Directory Coordination Network for England and Wales. Um, so um, so we've got sort of a growing expansion in particularly in the UK. It's now the uh, the major staffing of the National Speed Insurance Scheme. Again, based on the evidence, um, the major staffing of the scheme is um, local area coordinators and independent planners. So it's sort of, it started from a very, very humble beginnings, but now it's sort of, um, you know, uh, 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 is, is scaled sort of uh, quite substantially. But the point I want to make is we've got 30 years of uninterrupted learning and an evidence base across different countries and settings and different target groups. Um, and really the evidence base is that if you do it right with fidelity, highly valued, you get really positive outcomes, individual, family, community level, the money goes a long way, and it's very well aligned with, with, um, with um, sort of policy strategic reforms. So um, the million dollar question, of course, is how it can be implemented with fidelity? And so I just want to talk a bit about the framework um, and about where sort of money fits into it. So the vision starts with the right question about a, a good life for people rather than services. It talks about outcomes, including citizenship. Uh, the Charter is an important one, so it's about building partnerships with individuals and families as they build and pursue their goals and dreams for a good life, and with local communities to strengthen their capacity to include people with disabilities as valued citizens. So it's sort of, you know, it does focus on the dual levels of partnerships alongside people, but also work at the community level. And I just want to say to you that in, you know, the 30 years I've been involved with local area coordination, we started with a Charter around this idea of self-sufficiency. We then moved to some words around choice and control, which was a disaster. And then we moved back to these words, okay, which sort of repositioned the money and the choice and control bit to be a little bit further down the road and not something that's a primary focus. Uh, the best image for me is people alongside people in their local community. Uh, and so the original work, and that's one acknowledge, um, is from the, um, the left area coordination framework in, um, in Western Australia. So the principles, um, again, this is like a very deeply embedded uh, evidence-based framework. Uh, citizenship rights and responsibilities, uh, participation and contribution, natural authority, the importance of family, friends and personal networks, uh, information to enhance decision-making, uh, choice and control, the complementary nature of services, the importance of partnerships and lifelong learning. Just a couple of those. So the choice and control is there. So the fact is things work better when people can choose who comes into their life, when and what they do. That's, that's a fact. But the, the thing about complementary nature of services is that services and funding shouldn't replace the most important things in people's lives, which are family, friends and community. So it's about complementing, not taking over. So I think uh, that, that principle for me, I think is extremely important. And then the things that local area coordinators do uh, in this evidence-based model, they start at the beginning around relationships, about information, and uh, planning and clarification around advocacy, around partnerships and collaboration to build community, using personal community networks to develop practical solutions, and then bring in the money. And so the money is important. And um, you know, we've, we've had 30 years experience with uh, direct payments to people. Uh, when done well, it's been very effective. We had a very simple system, graduated amounts of small amounts of money, smaller packages, then larger packages different levels of accountability and flexibility. Uh, and when done well in the context of a trusting positive relationship, we found people start to uh, trust the government. So we, we so the government trusts people and people trust the government. In fact, it's well known that 
you know, nearly each year about 10% of funding is returned. So this thing about people can't be trusted is simply not true when it's in the context of an ongoing trusted um, relationship. Um, so, um, so again, um, I, think, I think the evidence is that um, small amount, graduated amounts of direct payments uh, in the context of an ongoing relationship, uh, I think the golden rule would be money would be the last thing that you would do as opposed to the first thing you would do. And so, so one of the struggles with working with local area coordination in the context of the NDIS is, given legislation and the focus on participants and plans and all that, is how you keep driving back to the relationship and the connection and the building blocks prior to then thinking about how the money can be used to complement and support the great ideas that have been generated through people's um, personal, social, family and community sort of networks. So locally coordination is one, um, one issue there and um, like it's almost been a lifetime's work trying to think about how you keep fidelity, how you keep evidence. What we do know is if you break with the fidelity, you take shortcuts, you lose a lot of the outcomes. So the long-term locally coordination story is when done well, it's very repeatable, it's very scalable, uh, very consistent outcomes, good outcomes for people and the money goes a long way. A second example I want to do is um, about um, this sort of community living plan. So we had a situation in Western Australia where despite, you know, um, individualised funding, we still had a lot of people that were um, getting stuck in group homes and people that were still picking, picking group homes. So I took on a project which was really thinking about how can we support people with more significant disabilities, think about having their own, their own home in the community as an alternative to a group home. And so basically, I uh, got together a sort of a, a, a steering committee of people, disabilities and families and other people. We did the research. We came up with a series of building blocks, a series of different support models. We created a funding stream, which was a really modest $25,000 bucket of money. What we did is say, uh, this is not based on critical need. It's all based on positive planning to build the building blocks for your own home and life in the community. So we totally reframed the incentives for the money from a negative critical to a positive building. Um, and so just in terms of where we got to, in 18 months, we got 100 people into their own homes through this strategy. Um, and uh, very, very interestingly, a lot of these people had been stuck on waiting lists for, for very large packages of support. So I think the question for me is, well, same people, but different practice framework, different ideas, um, and so I just want to talk through just some of the building blocks because um, in many ways they're incredibly simple, but it, it is about the positioning. You know, so you've got, you know, person by person, their dreams and vision for their own life, their own home, in the community where they belong. You know, the left-hand side, you'll see uh, the network of family, friends and supporters. Then you get into the planning bit, the vision building and the planning, and then there's, you know, clarity around decision-making and governance, uh, exploring better, um, imagining better, uh, planning for, for contribution engagement, a practical plan around uh, support and resources, where you want to live and who you want to live with, and then this concept of partnerships and shared responsibility. So just a couple of the real, I think, real gems in this is um, if you build the network before you plan, you get bigger ideas, you get more ideas, and people bring more resources. And when you talk about partnerships and shared responsibility, people found a lot of creative ways of family bringing their own resources and community being resources to houses, to housing, as opposed to thinking that the government's going to do everything. So we, we sort of used um, this, this sort of uh, frame. We also then did a very simple, you know, different options of what having your own home might look like. Uh, no rocket science here, you know, you're living in a penny with visiting support, a neighbourhood network, the key ring sort of idea, the self-help mutual support network, the good neighbour concept, sharing a home with living support, and then a sort of co-housing arrangement. But the key with all these is a modest amount of money goes a long way when you start with people, family, networks, uh, freely given support and um, relationships. And then the money comes in and adds layers to that and complements and supports it. So people end up with um, a much richer and fuller life, uh, but also the money happens to go, uh, go much further. 
So if you just say, well, this is all about cost cutting, then you're probably not going to go anywhere. <laughs> but if you do build, use money to help build the positive building blocks, uh, it sort of gets people off their backsides a little bit, sort of waiting for someone to do something, to come along with a bucket of money, and it helps people get started to build things in a practical way. And just sort of going back to the uh, sort of um, this one here, we, we, uh, we did what we call a community living placemat. We, we printed hundreds and thousands of these uh, placemats that people would uh, take home with them and families would have these on their coffee tables and they'd be thinking about, okay, where are we? What, are we, what have we got? What do we need to think about next? Where can we start? And it got a lot of younger families thinking about how important friends and networks are and their own resources while the kids are still at school because kids, when they leave school, uh, often... Uh, find a place to live, you know, through their friends at school or sport or family networks. But somehow with disability, we think that the government's going to come along and do all this. So, so this was a very simple uh, framework and set of resources and research. But the practice framework uh, seemed to cut through a lot of the inertia. And um, so a small amount of money went a very long way. But the practice framework was very rigorous about where you started and when you brought money in. So I just want to move on to a couple of examples um, where, where it's important for families to do things for themselves. And uh, probably like a lot of you, I struggle with this idea, you know, older families with sons and daughters thinking about what's going to happen when we die. And, um, you, know, are we going to, you know, what's going to happen to their family member? A universal problem right around the world. So a group of families in Canada got together in the late 1980s. So they've been going for a long while now. And so they had a series of four key values. The first one was um, that, some of the, some things are family business. So family culture, traditions, family money, family anxiety, these are things that are best shared uh, uh, between families. Okay, professionals have a role, but there's something unique here that families can share with other families. So the family should lead this agenda. Uh, secondly, the belief that safety and security uh, is through relationships. Uh, and so the importance of uh, personal relationships and networks in people's lives. Thirdly, a belief that everybody can contribute and be a valued member of their community. So this unlocks the personal networks. Uh, and then fourthly, self-sufficiency, that government can, can give and take away. So families committed to raising their own money through their own con membership contributions and through social enterprise to, uh, to independently uh, fund um, a small umbrella organisation and network facilitators that would help build and sustain uh, networks around their a family member with a disability. So this has been going for 30 years now and uh, a lot of long-term evidence about how the networks have uh, been built and parents have uh, unfortunately passed away and family values and culture and tradition and quality of life have been able to continue. So I think the, the, the bit I really took from that was um, some things are family business, they're not government business, and that um, government's got its role to do with basic income and support, but uh, families also have a role here uh, and where they're able to, um, you know, families to be supported to do, to do this for themselves. Look, the other, the other idea that sort of, um, I know, Simon, you, you're also interested in sort of big ideas, you know, the universal basic income is one. Uh, the Canadian people, again, these were the um, Alec Mansky, Vicky Kamak sort of people from Canada, very sophisticated. From that plan uh, foundation, they did a lot of work around wills and trusts. And so there were barriers to people leaving money for their loved one because people would lose their pension. You know, so, so it was a bit like governments making it really hard. So they came up with this idea about the registered dis disability uh, savings plan in Canada, which basically meant that people could put money into trust. It could then come out and in its best form, it would not affect people's uh, pension and basic, um, basic income. So then it sort of it created a savings environment where we've sort of got this big intergenerational wealth transfer. Somehow, I hate to say it, but a lot of people will buy kids, you know, buy their other kids um, a house, a car, they'll send them to uni, but sometimes, you know, the kid's got disability, it's all, no, 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 the government's going to do everything. This sort of does free up, uh, it makes easier for people to make their own provision so that people have got their own independent income. And so it was quite elegant because it was really around getting government out of the way. So government was making it hard for families to do things for themselves. 
So this is not the answer to everybody, but a nice little twist on, on this was even for low-income families, they could put money in and the government would match it. It's a bit like the super guarantee the, um, in the Australian sort of environment. So I thought from a public policy point of view, uh, both the Canadian examples were very elegant examples of get the government out of the way, what can people do uh, for themselves and try and uh, cut, through, uh, cut through the system. Eddie, can I just, just stop you for a minute, just because yeah. I'm conscious that we've only got 10 minutes, so I just want to check in with people yeah. to see. Yeah. Um, is look, that all right? Yeah, yeah, look, look I'm, happy, I'm happy to finish there. And really, what, what I really wanted to sort of get to was um, shifting. I'll just go straight to my last slide. So, um, is, you know, shifting power is difficult. Uh, and systems swing back to the status quo. So that's just like absolute reality. So, so if we're going to try and build something that's scalable, uh, you need to embed values and theory into a current practice framework, and we need to deal with this issue of fidelity. And so really this whole thing about uh, practice framework, fidelity, where money fits in, and then uh, implementation, really having a solid uh, theory of change around implementation. So just other bits, you know, um, I'll probably, I'll probably I'll just leave it there, but I think implementation and embedding fidelity and then um, I think not much, you know, projects are good, but we need to think about how to embed and scale ideas as opposed to just adding them on to a system that doesn't work. So I'll finish there um, and um, happy, to, happy now to turn it over to broad discussion, either back to Simon's points or anything here that um, uh, people are interested in. Thanks, Eddie. Um, could you just um, unshare your screen, Eddie, please? Can I what, sorry? Can you just stop sharing your screen? Uh, yep, I can. Sorry, it just then means we can all get to see each other again. So yeah, how do I do that? Um, if you go up to the top yep. and the green button. Green. It oh, should, if you, yeah, if you yeah, hover, it. there we go. Got it, yep. Okay. So we don't have loads of time, but um, I, I think that was a real balance of some kind of big philosophical questions about how we're working and then some really practical. And I, I'm really grateful, Eddie, because I, I know that obviously it's not everybody's experience is really different currently in Australia and currently with the NDIS. And I don't know, I just find it a bit reassuring that there are models out there that do work and this, you know, the, the notion that how do you how do we find the stuff that sticks? And I think we probably do know that stuff, but, but the kind of next big idea is pretty interesting, that concept of, yeah, some of the stuff that you, you were reminding me of, this is the stuff that works, and that's what we know works. Um, government isn't the answer. And, yeah, I don't know. That's where it took my thinking. Um, what about everywhere, everyone else? Anybody want to kind of chip in? You, you, I'm not sure if you're all looking a bit stunned <laughs> or um, of pensive. Silvana. Uh, Sorry, hello Steve. Hello, everyone. I've stopped crying. <laughs> Thank you, both Eddie and Simon. I think it was interesting to hear both, um, um, both, both perspectives. Uh, what what really um, struck me about what each of it, um, each of you was saying, I think for Simon, uh, when you really talked about the money should follow uh, me and my journey, I, I think that really that really uh, sort of connected with what Eddie said, uh, which is um, you know how do we um, build relationships and uh, what is the role of family. And use it, you know, starting there and building that, and then a money conversation. So I, I sort of uh, really found both of your perspectives um, helpful in making sense of why I was so deeply distressed by Karim's second planning meeting this afternoon, uh, because that was a funding conversation uh, that wasn't good listening, uh, that wasn't about valuing. Um, the everyday journey um, and um, having to show evidence of Krim's disability now that he's 28 
uh, in light of the fact that for nine years he'd been on a individualised package in New South Wales where he'd never been asked and we'd never been asked to prove his disability uh, and provide reports. So seeing this system right now um, lacking fidelity in the implementation, um, sort of quite, I think, quite a controversial surprise for me, given that I have had full hope and faith in this national scheme that um, has, you know, set out to achieve so much and is transforming many people's lives. So thank you to the two of you and thanks everybody for your kind thoughts and your understanding and sorry if it was too traumatizing seeing so upset. I'm usually a happy, jolly pe person for those who don't know. You are. Um, thanks, Silvana. Steve? Um, yeah, um, kind of uh, really important, I think, the things that uh, have been presented this morning and be also good to um, have uh, some copies of uh, the uh, um, slideshow that's just been used. I fear that in the UK we are um, absolutely struggling with politically everything going towards uh, our leaving the European Union and those kinds of things. And we've seen in the past in our history how when big things come along like climate change, like leaving uh, the common market or those kinds of things, the transformation programs for people with learning disabilities uh, just slow down and, and don't really happen. The current big thing being introduced uh, for social workers is strengths and assets models, but how those are used um, could be quite crucial if it's about assuming that, um, that good social workers uh, empower families to use their assets more. That could be good, but it could also be because, I mean, many, many social workers these days are now on agency or other arrangements um, that um, unless you actually activate family assets, you won't have a job in a year's time or whatever it is, you know? So I think it's a really important time um, to try and keep these, these aims on the agenda. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm really conscious of coming up to the end of our time and I can see people are already having to leave because it's, um, it's a holiday here tomorrow, so it's Anzac Day tomorrow, so I think people are leaving a bit earlier than usual. So I'm just going to put the last words to Simon and Eddie. Is there anything you want to say as we finish? Um, no, I think it's, it is interesting, isn't it, how I think that this conversation, as I say, is we we haven't had a chance to perhaps make it as um, discursive as we'd like, but it touches things at a, at, at a it touches politics, and it's it's interesting how the word government has floated in and around this conversation, yeah. um, and I think that's for good reason. I don't think we, I think there is a much more serious debate we need to have, um, and I don't think we can simply put government in a box that says, oh, that's something we need to put over there and get or or make it something that we're living with all the time so i think there's a there's a whole conversation about our rights um social structures the constitution of the societies we live in if we go back to the question of citizenship which is where this is starting then i think that we recognize that that money is a, is a bit like a kind of electrical thing that's sharpens the whole conversation and makes people realize that um, I guess I, I maybe I'm coming at this point of view yeah abundance is the right framework but there are some things that are scarce money is finite and therefore the distribution of money is a political question and and I think and maybe that's just the way that my journey's taken me on with a lot of these ideas but I, I, I can certainly, if I'm working with a family and thinking about these things, then you say, well, what are the constraints we've got and how do we do the best? Because talking about government is irrelevant to solving the problem. But I think if we're going to talk as citizens about the society we're in, then we also need to address these deeper issues. We need to have an honest conversation about um, 
money, power, and how these things are distributed across our society. Because at the moment, injustice is the norm. Okay, Eddie, anything you want to say? Yeah, look, just probably a couple of things. Um, there's still an enormous amount we can do person by person, just with the people that we work with and support sort of, you know, in our daily lives. So, um, so, so I wouldn't, so I know the money, money is a big issue, but the relationship issue and what we can do person by person is still fundamentally important. And we can try and do that the best that we can in any event. So I think that's, and then I, then I, I do think practice frameworks and each of us work somewhere where there is some documentation about our practice, what we're trying to do. I, I just want to say that if you get that, get that really robust and in the right order, then that will start to drive people to things that people can do as opposed to things that you can't do because of lack of money. So, so money is an issue that is important to bring into the equation, but if you start there, you, you often don't, you don't get past that. So, so, uh, so a practice framework and starting in the right place and trying to work with what you've got in a positive sense, you do confront the money issue, but um, you're better off starting there and doing what you can do as opposed to just getting caught waiting, which I think is a very negative situation. So, And the good thing is I'm always banging on about evidence, you know, so trying to get the system to take, you know, what is the evidence about what works? And so with advocacy, you know, it's about evidence about what works. That's the most effective. Fantastic. Thank you, Eddie. Um, okay, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Eddie. That feels like a really big topic um, and loads to think about. And, now, and again, it feels like there's not enough time. Um, and I just uh, would urge people to go on to Citizen Network members' um, Facebook page. And if you've got any thoughts, you know, start a conversation there because we're the people who are in this conversation. And I think there's lots of people who are members of Citizen Network who watch the films. And I think you would really appreciate to hear your thoughts about the, the subject. Once you, certainly I, I, I kind of percolated for a bit. So um, yeah, please do go over and um, yeah, share what you're thinking. Um, thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Simon, again. Thank you, everybody. Um, and I shall see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.